Has everybody done their sign up for the Hootsuite account? I recommend doing that today. Um, the, there's in Blackboard a link to the form that you need to use which verifies that you're part of our program. So you complete the form and then it will give you a code. You want to store that code somewhere because when you are ready to do the exam, it's like a little e-commerce page. You'll see a link, uh, do you have a coupon code? And you'll just paste it in there. That's what's going to eliminate the $99 cost for you. So don't put in any credit card information. All you need is your code and it will zero out the cost and then you'll be able to take the exam. Um, that exam, you need 65% on it to pass the exam and get the certification. I believe that you can do it more than once if you uh, don't get 65%. Um, so that's handy. I don't know. Is this flashing on and off behind me? Is that <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's like a weird light show happening. I'll see if I can tighten that up. So I think you've got about 75 minutes to write uh, the series of multiple choice. And then when you pass, what you should do is screenshot your results. And you're going to load that to me uh, through Basecamp. And you'll also get um, a link that takes you to kind of a like proof of verification page where you'll be able to actually get your certificate. And there are some easy buttons to click if you want to add that to your LinkedIn profile or if you want to add your name to the list of um, Hootsuite certified platform um, people. They've got kind of a directory list there. And um, there's also a function to download that certificate. So you just into Blackboard for the component of our course to show that you've done it and how you did on the quiz. Just sort of uh, screenshot that, upload your certificate. The certificate doesn't say what you got on it. So that's why I'm saying just screenshot or capture um, your actual score. If you have any challenges or problems, um, especially if you're not around for the next couple of weeks, then definitely do your login and just make sure everything is working. There are two series of um, training programs. The one that you're looking for is this Hootsuite platform training. That's the one that's associated with the certificate. There is another one that is uh, social media. So there's lots of good info in that one if you're interested in developing some of the digital skills further. But it's the platform certificate that, um, that you're looking for. It's a series of 45 videos. There's short videos. There's little quizzes in between that will help you understand the type of exam questions you'll see on the certification. And um, it should take maybe an hour and a half to go through all 45. It's not actually very long. And then depending on how confident you feel in um, the questions, you might take some extra time to think about. Um, I, I would say having done that certification, focus especially on the um, some of the enterprise and like large team management components so the later videos or um, for mine anyway seem to be a heavy emphasis on those questions so um, don't just wing it actually make sure you do uh, especially those later videos any questions about the food suite component um, Ideally, you could get it done as soon as possible. The sort of latest date would be by June 15th at 5, because I'm moving back to Canada, um, which means that movers are going to come and take away all my furniture and my computers. Um, UCD eventually will uh, drop my access. I want to be able to get in all your grades and feedback and stuff. So the um, certification, if you could do that at least before the, the 16th, that will be helpful. So today we're going to talk about all the fun things and future trends in marketing and marketing technology, how the robots are going to take over the world. And on day one, we looked at this graph from Mark Schaefer about the four digital revolutions. And I'm sure going through the audit yesterday, you found many of your brands are probably still 
at that discovery stage. You know, they've got a website with basic presence. Um, they maybe don't have a lot of interactive content or a clear reason for the audience to return to the site. Maybe you found technical issues with page load times or um, errors that would, you know, limit visibility in search. Um, lots of brands are still in that kind of light green circle just trying to figure out their social media presence. Um, so they may lack utility. Uh, if you were calculating engagement rates, you probably saw engagement rates, um, you know, below 1%, uh, where they've got content and they're posting, but they're not necessarily engaging with their audience. The next revolution is this immersion revolution of wearable technology, augmented reality, filters, and there are certainly products and tools already in the marketplace. The true impact of that has yet to come, so that's our focus for today. What is going to happen or where are, are people predicting this is going to go? So we'll start in the very uh, sort of presence and near future in terms of marketing automation, already a very um, well adopted marketing uh, technology software and it basically automates repetitive tasks. We're going to dig into this a lot further on Tuesday, but the general idea is in the past, someone would come to your website, they'd request information like a white paper, and then you'd manually go to whatever your database is, find that white paper, email it to them, make a calendar notation to follow up with them in a couple days, see if they want to talk to a sales rep, or maybe there's another um, sort of low risk offer you can present to them. So anything that is repetitive or manual has been automated through marketing automation technology. These communication strategies are often called drip marketing. So you drip or release a series of pre-written messages based on a bunch of variables that you set up in the system. So someone's looking for this thing, then provide that. If they do this, then do that. So it's choose your own adventure for marketing. And it's basically like a little if this, then that recipe. The idea is that you can automate a lot of these processes, both from how you attract people to your website, what they do on the site, how you do lead marketing, um, lead scoring, how you convert leads into opportunities, all the way through to onboarding existing customers and then creating nurture campaigns or loyalty campaigns. So lots of um, B2B brands focus very heavily on how they can automate many of these processes and then consumer brands will do that as well. Again, we'll talk more about it on Tuesday, but a preview for those of you away. And the, the other side or sort of companion to marketing automation is programmatic marketing, programmatic ad buying. Previously, ad agencies would look at um, how they would buy media space on behalf of brands that they're representing. And so they would use analytics and make judgment calls about the bid and the spend and the type of reach that they wanted. And there are still people who are manually upping and downing bids and doing this type of research, especially for smaller campaigns. But instead, what most agencies and large organizations are doing is programmatic ad buying. So someone creates a series of variables and then it, an algorithm decides. So the algorithm is bumping up or down the bids, changing the placement of those ads. And this is for the most part, how it's done 100% in television, radio, out-of-home advertising. And more and more, it is becoming the process that brands are using for search advertising and display advertising. So we'll talk about that on um, Tuesday, Wednesday as well. The idea is not necessarily that this is just to save time. There are certainly efficiencies that you build in through marketing automation and programmatic ad buying. But what is really happening is that algorithmic marketing, using an algorithm to make these decisions, you can tap into really advanced analytic um, methods, including predictive analytics. So you have computers that are better and faster at picking out trends in data that humans might not see. And so natural language processing, text mining, 
sentiment analysis, you can set up all these variables that help the algorithm understand what you as a human interpret out of that data. And then you can trigger these timed offers and communications and even prices. So you'll see this often with airline pricing. Maybe you've had the experience of searching for flights and you come up with a price and a couple days later you go back and look and the price are astronomical. It could be if you cleared your cookies, tried on another computer or a different device, that you're going to see a totally different set of pricing options. Right? There's lots of little programmatic things that are happening in the background with um, cookies especially that are personalizing the experience for you, sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a, in a negative way. So one of the examples of, of this type of programmatic uh, trigger in Canada, Sears Automotive knows that uh, a five-year-old car battery is going to die after three consecutive days of sub-zero temperature, and so it programmatically triggers advertising campaigns on day four. So there are all these little tiny wins that larger brands are making um, that have substantial impacts on their, on their revenue. Timberland sends out these kind of email prompts that are triggered by things like a three-day forecast for rain. Hey, it's going to be really wet. You've been looking at this rain jacket. Maybe now's the time. Here's a discount code. Right? So all of those offers are being triggered by variables that are identified by these kind of algorithms that look at huge reams of data and spot trends in purchase behavior. So here we kind of have 75 years of climate data cross-referenced with online shopping behavior that is triggering these types of um, personalized recommendations that seem ultra useful and relevant and therefore tend to have a higher sales lift than, oh, we think it's going to be sunny, let's market sunscreen now. The market or industry for environmental forecasting, commercial weather um, analysis, all of that, I couldn't find a more updated step, but um, 2013, they were saying this is already a $3 billion industry. And there are a ton of these companies that now specialize in weather data. There are companies that specialize in trending data for fashion, all the fashion houses um, buy their information, and then lots of large retailers also buy all this weather forecasting information. So what happens is uh, there are sites like Weather Trends Analytics that have a one degree list. And what they're able to spot through all these huge bits of data are purchase behavior trends. And the one degree list is this compilation of all of the purchase changes that happen with just a one degree change in temperature. So in the fall in North America, you get a one degree temperature drop and sales for mousetrap surge by 25%. For Harley-Davidson uh, dealerships, the absolute optimal day for revenue is 22 degrees and sunny. So these brands are starting to use that kind of weather data to think about product, to think about staffing needs, to anticipate um, where sales are going to come from. IBM, uh, uh, their research team is involved in this as well. They have algorithms that are running in cities around the world. Rio de Janeiro is one of them. And it has this kind of unique typography that uh, is very hilly. It has interesting terrain. They've got these weather patterns that basically create unpredictable or previously unpredictable um, flooding and landslides. So what the IBM research team and their algorithms do is that they can um, predict 40 hours ahead how much rainfall is going to come and how that will unfold in Rio. So you have lots of you know, planning elements that can be tapped into there. Uh, I read a, a, a very sort of scathing uh, article that was looking at how companies, especially in America, like Walmart, you want to write off a bunch of inventory. Maybe you ship that to um, you know, Florida, where there's going to be massive floodings, and it's like, make your insurance claim. Um, so the, there are all of these things. There are certainly positive ways that people are using that kind of data and predictive analytics. And then there's also um, you know, other, <laughs> other shady ways, maybe. Um, so government, healthcare, retail, hospitality, there's lots of industries that are increasingly relying on big data analytics and those trends that can be seen or more readily identified by computer algorithms instead of humans. So the term big data should not be confused with lots of data. 
when we're talking about big data, we're talking about data sets that are so large they can't actually fit on a single computer or even a series of network computers. You have to have this like massive infrastructure to be able to actually parse and understand these data sets. And it means that there's a lot of noise, it's really hard to pinpoint what's actually relevant, at least it's hard for humans. It's not so hard for computers because what they end up doing is creating these predictive models based on segments of the data. So if we've got you know, hundreds of millions or trillions of pieces of data points, what these algorithms do is say, okay, show me this very small amount. What do I know and understand about this chunk? Okay, is that the same in this chunk of data, this chunk of data, this chunk of data? So Julie played that um, video for us about how Google search works when it's trying to find a website that matches the criteria you put in. It's going through its index saying what are all the pages that we know about cheetahs and running speed, which one of these matches this actual criteria. So what's happening with big data analytics is that same kind of idea. We're looking for this kind of trend or these sorts of markers. What do we see um, in a chunk of data and how do we test that against the larger data set? So if you want to think about examples of where this plays out in you know, our everyday life, this is a chart that shows what happens every minute on the internet. So Google is literally processing 2.4 million searches every minute. In that same amount of time, you've got 700,000 people logging onto Facebook. And if you think about the millions of photos and videos and pieces of text that get uploaded, text alone, we've got web pages, ebooks, comment fields, like there's just a ton of data that can be mined and understood through these natural language processing systems that start to really understand like what is this phrase about, not just the words in it. Um, and that also means that these computers are, and algorithms are able to start to understand what's in a photograph. Because the same way that we teach children, you know, this is a chair, that's a chair, we show them lots of chairs, they start to understand, oh yeah, that's, that's a chair. A chair has, you know, this flat bit and a hard bit. Well, this has a flat bit and a straight up bit, but no, this is a table. Right, so we're educating the machine through all of that data that we load through social media profiles. So now these um, algorithms and, and search, if you think about image search, they're able to find, oh, I'm looking for, you know, blue, this kind of thing. And it's not just using text data or metadata in the image, it's actually able to look at and understand what that image is. Humans, are, of course, are a lot faster at processing what is in a particular image, but we're not very good at processing that millions of times over. And so that's the benefit of computers and these algorithms. Google Photos um, is, is <laughs> helpful and freaky. So if you use Google Photo, you'll see that the, the algorithm that is part of that starts to understand oh yeah, these are pictures of Minnick, and this is pictures of James, and these are pictures of Finley, and I'm, uh, you know, I'll just group those into albums for you. Oh, I noticed you were in Portugal. Here are all your images that are of Portugal. So the, these types of um, tools like Google and Netflix and Facebook and Amazon start to know an awful lot about us that they can map against this larger data set to understand and be predictive about our type of behavior. So Google famously showed that they could predict flu outbreaks based on when and where people were searching for flu-related terms. So there's all sorts of interesting applications of this. And if we use an example and think about, you know, how does Facebook, even if we look at its ad technology, how does it decide what kind of ads show up in our newsfeed? What's happening here is a lot of big data analytics. Next week we'll talk about setting up Facebook ads, but the very first thing that you do is you decide on your objective. We've been talking about the race framework, so you know, what, do you, what is this ad? Is it just awareness and reach? Is it about interaction, social media engagement, or is it conversion? If you're creating an ad campaign that is about conversion, I want people to, this ad to be shown to people who are more likely to click on it and make a purchase or download or sign up or whatever the action is, show it to people like that. So how does the algorithm decide to do that? Well, it goes and it looks through all that ream of user data to understand these are the types of people that match your audience criteria. So maybe we want to target um, college grads or college students. So what do we know about the types of ads that college students 
typically click on, that they, this would be an ad that converts. And very quickly, you end up getting these like 10 trillion data points because it's like, all right, if we have served you know, 100 ads to, we've got 200 million college grads that have self-identified through their profile data, um, and they start looking at, well, what time of day was the ad posted? What are the text and sentiment of the actual ad copy? What's in this image? What kind of colors? Is it about are they faces or food photos? And so they're all these judgments and cues and trends that the algorithm can pick out. So when you as an advertiser say, I want you to show my ad to people who are most likely to convert in this kind of audience, the algorithm is saying, okay, what do I know about one million of the, the 200 million people who match that audience criteria? Go through the algorithm, show me the types of ads that they typically click on, compare that to the other 199 million data points that we have and decide whether this is the type of ad that we're going to show to people who typically convert. Of this segment, who are those people that would type or click on that particular type of ad that has this kind of image is going to be posted at this time of day within this type of news feed uh, on a desktop or a mobile. So it's looking at all this um, millions and trillions of, of little data points and they're using this predictive model to decide who to show it to. And as the real-time analytics come in of who's actually clicking, then it's adjusting. So it's learning and thinking and adjusting that predictive model based on your activity. Facebook is not alone in this, so Netflix, all the movie suggestions that you get, it's the same kind of process. Um, Tinder, if you're flicking through, again, it's these algorithms that are deciding um, predictively what you are most likely uh, to, to like and enjoy and, and, and be engaged with. So the application for financial institutions, healthcare, education, government, utility companies, right, to think about energy consumption usage and how we reduce that. All of, all of those industries are currently experimenting or have leading players who are already using these types of algorithms. And big data and analytics related to our social media behavior is really the tip of the iceberg. So this next thing that we have happening in the immersion revolution is the internet of things. So all the internet connected devices in our home, in our car, all the sensors that you have in wind turbines and um, jet engines. And so the internet of things, you've got these 50 billion connected devices, devices connected to the internet that feed data back and forth from the device to manufacturers. Smart homes, smart cars, smart energy grids, all of that usage data is sent back to the manufacturer. So in the negative, you could build in obsolescence of certain products, so ensure that people have to um, pay for them more frequently or upgrade their, their stuff. Or you can also use that more positively. If you're a telco, you can detect network outages and immediately send out a, a repair crew. So that's an example of um, marketing automation, internal marketing automation, right? I'm going to send out an email or a text message to this internal group of people based on a trigger. If this, then that. Um, the other thing you'll see more of uh, smart cities, smart traffic lights that measure speed and volume of traffic and then coincide um, with traffic management software and services that remotely control or manage flow of traffic to eliminate um, more traffic jams or to monitor for transgressions. Um, cars stream data back to the manufacturers so they understand more about their operations, also their location. And uh, I'm sure you all heard about Volkswagen engineering their sensors to detect when the car was in an emissions um, test environment so it would flip over into its eco mode. So again, all these sensors and data um, can be you know, predictive, they can be kind of sentient, they can anticipate certain environments and then respond through automated triggers based on variables that are, are set by engineers or marketers or, or whoever is involved. And the data that comes from all of these sensors, we've got stationary things like smart houses, um, wind turbines, and then we've got kind of mobile 
devices like planes, trains, automobiles, where we can have real-time tracking of when the bus is going to arrive based on sensors and, and feeding this data back and forth. So airplane engineers um, use sensor data in jet engines and predictive analytics models to understand um, failure rates or, or predictions around when uh, elements will fail, and so then they can um, coordinate that with maintenance schedules. <laughs> the airplane is safer to fly. That seems like a good use of that kind of data. And in the 90s, you might have had maybe 50 data points for every individual flight. What happens now with all those sensors in individual jet engines is you're getting like a thousand data points um, for a single engine every single minute. Right, so all of that data starts to add up um, and it becomes too much for humans to parse and understand. You start doing the math on that and thinking about the internet of things and what we do on social media becomes a very small blip in that. Self-driving cars, um, automated drones are some of the other emerging technologies that are already in the market. We've got RFID tags that track products from when they leave the warehouse to when they arrive on your doorstep. So the idea around these sensors and the internet of things is um, we don't lose the data once it gets to your doorstep, we understand all the use of uh, usage patterns so that we can improve our sales, our marketing, or engineering of that particular product. And if you think about all the possible things in your home that could be automated or connected to the internet one day, that's an awful lot of data that marketers may have available to them. Um, smart light bulbs, for example, you could um, think about providing marketing and sales uh, information about how long the lights are left on or the temperature of the light or figure out what, cu what elements customers like or dislike. If the light is needing to be replaced, do you have the light flash red or do you just display an alert on a, on a connected app? Um, maybe you just allow a function within that app to say, hey, if the sensor is going to go, then automatically order that for me on Amazon and have the drone drop it on my back doorstep. Maybe then your house robot comes in and installs it. I don't know, right? Like, um, so the idea is how do we automate some of these um, things and gather the data in ways that is not intrusive but allows us to create better products to understand our audience and how they're using those products so that we can think about um, are we continually adding value? How do we ensure renewal or resubscription or repurchase of these types of products and services? And this is um, the way things are going in all sorts of industries where instead of selling people a thing, we have these subscription-based models. So software as a subscription where you don't go into a store and get the box for your software and then manually install it with disks and CDs. I don't even have a CD drive on my computer anymore, so how would, like, that doesn't happen. Um, now, you just, like, you download the software, it lives on your computer, it expires and suddenly you can't use it unless you renew that subscription. Um, so what is happening is that subscription as a serve, our, our software as a service, um, is what I'm trying to say, we've got products as service. So Rolls-Royce Rolls is one example of that. We're talking about their uh, jet engines rather than cars. But they have this power by the hour model. And what happens is that airlines are paying for the time that the Rolls-Royce jet engines are in use. So it used to be you paid for the engine and then you paid for the separate kind of maintenance and repair schedule. And so now it's all baked into the subscription model. It's this shift from selling a product to selling a service. So we're selling you the service, you pay for the time that you're using it and wrapped into that price is the maintenance and, and repairs. Slack is an example of software as a service. So it's uh, kind of like a WhatsApp for business. It combines or replaces things like email, Dropbox, 
um, file sharing, time management, and has a bunch of these automated features around chatbots. So if you are in the office and you want to know, you know, what's the address of the San Francisco office, instead of going to an admin person or a colleague and asking that information, you type it into Slack. What's, what's the office? And the Slack bot um, uses natural language processing and machine learning to understand what it is you're asking and to go and get that information for you. So software as a service, product as a service, are all sold on these subscription models. So if we think about that race framework, this is the important shift towards the final E for engage. How do we continually prove or reinforce the value of the product or service um, that we're providing? And all of that big data gives you some information about predictive um, predictive stats around who will renew or not, and what kind of uh, retargeting campaign you might use, or nurturing campaign, or automated subscription renewal. So all of that is uh, interesting usage, and it sounds great. The challenge with especially the internet of things is the security of all of this data, data that's going back and forth from our home to who actually knows where. Um, websites in general are far more secure than your smart home or your smart car. Most of these Internet of Things devices lack this kind of basic security measure like properly encrypted data, which means, um, you know, last or, or late 2015, there was a group of hackers that took down an entire power grid in Western Ukraine. They just hacked into it. Um, so that was the first blackout that was from a cyber attack. Hackers are always looking for new targets to strike um, to have greater impact. So if we're all driving smart cars down the N11, could someone disable all our cars simultaneously? Um, so they're looking to be disruptive, and there are lots of security holes with um, power grids, electrical dams, chemical plants, and then all these personal devices that we use. So if you've got a smart home, um, maybe burglars learn to disarm your home remotely. Or better yet, they learn how to listen to the data, run a predictive analytics model to know when you are most likely not to be home. That'd be a good time to, to break in, right? So it's, I mean, it's one of these things that it's like, yes, it's good to be aware of and slightly worried about these problems, but they're identifiable identified problems, which means someone's working on solutions to these. Um, the thing to think about is what is more obscure or what are the factors involved in these kinds of algorithms or tools that are maybe less obvious to us. So I have a little story for you to read and then some questions um, because I want to think about like what are the cognitive biases that we build into some of these systems. Um, so this is a little story. I'll give you a can you read it properly? Big enough? So what I want you to think about as you read the story are these kind of four questions. Okay. I'm 
I don't know if my math is working here. <laughs> I'm trying to count and then I see your arms moving. Uh, false. How many people think this one's false? Any, not sure? We don't have enough information? Question 319, Pat Sarvi has been cleared of guilt. How many people say true? We don't have enough information, we're not sure. <coughs> okay, so number one, Pat Flaherty is known to have been at the scene of the killing of Akila Masabi Lark. People who say that's false or unsure. Why why do you say that? been walking along, unassuming, have a boulder fall on you, right? There's all sorts of ways. And um, killed, uh, killed versus murdered. And so, number three, one man, Pat Sardi, has been cleared of guilt. What, um, what, what about the six people here? Yeah. I don't know if it's a man or a woman or whatever we say for <laughs> So then, number four. How many people would say this is true? The following events were included in the story. A man was killed. Police rounded up to ten suspects near the scene of the murder. All suspects wanted to kill him with Savilari killed, and one man has been positive, positively cleared of guilt. Yeah. newspaper articles or um, whatever. We see content in our news feed that maybe a friend has shared. We don't fully read the article. We read the headline. And so what happens is that we feel like rational human beings, that we're making rational decisions every day. But our, our brains actually make shortcuts, right? We make shortcuts to jump to conclusions. Um, just to streamline our day. If you spent every possible second over analyzing everything that you read, everything that you saw, you wouldn't get very far from your bed in the morning because your brain would be overloaded. So it's important to think about some of the cognitive biases that happen when we are uh, experiencing media or hearing things that our friends say or experts or um, politicians or or whatever. And these are just four of some of the 20 plus uh, cognitive biases that sort of screw up our decision making or falsely lead us into believing that we've understood all the elements. 
So anchoring bias is when people are over-reliant on the first piece of information that they've heard. So in salary negotiations, this happens. The first person who um, you know, uh, makes the offer or establishes you know, what the salary is going to be, that kind of frames for us what the possible areas of negotiation are. Availability heuristic, people often overestimate the importance of information that's available to them. Often your personal experience will uh, trump any uh, sort of collective data or scientific data about a thing. Um, so if you think, oh, you know, smoking is bad, yeah, but my grandfather lived until he was 88, right? So we take our personal experience and apply it to, um, to, to the world around us. Confirmation bias, we tend to only listen to or absorb information that already, uh, that confirms a perception or bias that we already have. So this is one of the reasons why it's really hard to have conversations about climate change or politics or abortion or equal rights, gender equality, because we have to get beyond the bias, the confirmation bias that people already have. Um, stereotyping, so, we're all familiar with that. We sort of expect a group of people or a person to have certain qualities or behaviors or characteristics without having any real information about that person. And this was great when we lived in tribal societies and lived in castles and needed to defend our territory and you saw someone coming up who's like, well, what are they wearing? What do they look like? What do they sound like? Are they one of us? So that kind of protectionist mechanism our brains are old and not quite as evolved as the technology around us. We kind of use these um, stereotypes to make quick judgments about the world. And if you think about how these types of cognitive biases um, sort of impaired your reading of the story, you know, we've got these um, you know, shortcuts that we made around near versus at, or murdered versus killed, man versus women. Um, so availability heuristic, you know, you hear the name um, Pat Flaherty uh, or someone, maybe you know someone with that first name or last name, you start already imagining things about that person. You have this predetermined set of characteristics. You can probably imagine what Pat Flaherty looks like in your head if you started mulling that over. You know, you create a whole, a whole person. And so if you were alive in the 50s and the 60s, you might have read the story and been like, oh, Pat Flaherty, IRA. You know, you jump to conclusions reading these types of stories and we overhear stories about uh, bombs, about people who are Muslim, about um, what's happening uh, in the Middle East. And so when we read a story like this, there's lots of assumptions that are already kind of baked in or predetermined based on things that we've just been exposed to. So your unconscious bias triggers these kind of judgments, which means if we can pay attention to when we have a judgment or an opinion or a perception of, about something and just think, okay, well, wait, where did that come from? Let's just read that a little more closely. So baby boomers do this with millennials. They'll sort of uh, create a set of conclusions about how millennials are going to work uh, or be as employees. I sort of hate these kind of labels that we attach on, on generations because it's not necessarily a, a true way to define the behavior of everybody within you know, this bracket of people born between 1982 and 2004. Um, but it's a, it's a shortcut for people, the same way that race is a framework that helps us quickly understand objectives that we need to have. All of these biases sort of um, provide some you know, interesting look at the world, definitely one look. So what is often overlooked is that millennials really like a collaborative, flexible environment. I'm sure that's one of the things that you appreciate about the program that you're in. And so as a generation, you've got this sort of keen interest in self-development and community. And by community, I mean like more acceptance of things like you saw that in the equality referendum, right? So you're more accepting of people, you're more socially connected, you value those kind of connections. So where older generations will question the use of technology and privacy, but why would you want to share what you had for breakfast? You know, they're going to question all of those things because it's just a different set of values. They grew up in a different time with different pieces of technology and they're at different life stages. So the challenge that you'll have in the workplace is sort of the cognitive bias of the people you might have as managers 
or as clients or as peers. And also to think about when you're marketing products and services, you're marketing to people who don't necessarily think and behave and act exactly like you. So you want to think about, well, what are the biases or cognitive biases that my audience might have? What are their emotional triggers? So when you're thinking about your strategy component based on your audit, you're hyper-focusing on a particular audience, start thinking about, well, what are the cognitive biases that this particular audience group might have? How can we positively tap into the sort of emotional triggers or, or predetermined set of understanding of the world that this audience has? How can we use that to help them better understand whatever our product or service is? So if you are thinking about, um, if you have a brand that is uh, marketed to, to an even younger generation than you, this sort of label of uh, Generation Z, they're kind of less focused on price than your generation is, which is partly a life stage, right? You're in school, so uh, prices and discounts. Um, you know, when I look at strategy documents for social media, there's an awful lot about, you know, give this person a discount. Discounting your product or service is kind of a race to the bottom of the barrel because you'll always have a competitor who can undercut you. Maybe not immediately, but they'll figure out how to do it. So if we're thinking about that race framework and the E for satisfaction and loyalty and advocacy, the, the price discounts and stuff sort of, um, they don't work for creating that sense of loyalty. You need to think about what is it of value to that audience? How can you tap into that? So Generation Z, they're kind of less focused on price. They care more about speed and personalization. So if you have sort of a younger audience, then, then you would pitch to them, you know, here's how this personalizes your experience, or here's how it makes it faster or easier or more all about you. And the things that, you know, maybe I would find freaky around invasion of privacy, you wouldn't, and the generation after you certainly wouldn't, especially if it's in the name of greater personalization. So have you, um, have you seen this ad? I'll try to bring it up. I'm going to dual computer today so I can actually get the sound. I'll just play this little one so we all know what we're talking about. Daisy Dukes. Bikinis on top. No, I don't know. California Girls Lyrics. Here are the lyrics to California Girls. Sun-kissed skin so hot will melt your popsicle. Oh, yeah. 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 There you go. Right, lads, I'm off. All right. So. Miley and Beyonce need milking. So the technology that they're demonstrating there is this sort of voice activation commands that you can have from your phone. Uh, if you're familiar with the Amazon Alexa, it's a, like a little speaker in your home. And so I've got one at home in the morning. It's like, Alexa, tell me the weather or give me the news or what's the word of the day. My son loves it because he's like, Alexa, how big is the Tyrannosaurus Rex? And then she'll like tell him the answer to that. Or he'll be like, Alexa, play me a song because I've introduced all the Easter eggs to him. And she'll be like, what, who, me? And then start strumming a song. So it, like, it's a fun kind of interaction. It's very limited to the things you can ask, but it's the same as your phone. Like you're, you're actively seeking a, a piece of information and you're using voice instead of text for those micro moments. And the, the super fun thing is how all of that shortcuts these little steps in our life. But the sort of what's the other side of the coin is that those devices are always listening for your command, which means they're always listening, right? So your phone that you have around with you all the time is waiting for those voice commands, often recording the ambient noise in the environment because it doesn't necessarily know when you're going to ask a question or whether what you're talking about is going to end in a question for your device. And so uh, one of the things that you can do if you're curious about what your phone is actually recording in terms of the voice data, you can look at uh, myactivity.google.com and you'll see all of the information that Google is collecting about you and what kind of information might be active in terms of the microphone data. So back to big data and the biases in our algorithms that kind of run our life. 
Facebook, Google, Netflix, Tinder, all of these are using algorithms that identify your biases through past behavior. And so that information that we see in a newsfeed or a series of recommendations is kind of filtered based on often a bias that we don't recognize in ourselves towards certain types of media or stories or, or sources of information. And it creates a bit of an echo chamber that critics call the filter bubble. Um, and it's basically, we're gonna be shown material that matches our existing beliefs and preferences because that's how these tools ensure that we have an enjoyable experience using that platform. It's reinforcing information that we already believe or feel about ourselves. And so the, the challenge, or, or some of the, you know, the, the media stories and the academics who research this, there's sort of a debate about it, whether there's empirical evidence that this is a threat or not, that this kind of personalization or filter bubble exists. But what's unarguable is that people turn to Facebook and Twitter and social media for their news, not to newspapers or magazines or these traditional sources of media. So in the past where the gatekeeper was clear, I'm going to tune in to you know, CNN or Fox News or The Guardian, right? You're making a choice based on a whole bunch of connotations around that brand. You understand what, what the politics of that gatekeeper are. Um, in the case here, Google and Facebook don't see themselves as media companies because, well, we don't produce the content. We just display it. Right? So they want to act as if they're just the people who sell billboard advertising. You know, you happen to walk by that. But what happens is there's definitely a cognitive bias that's built into the algorithm that determines what appears in your newsfeed. And what is appearing there is not the same as you consciously deciding, I'm going to read this magazine or newspaper or turn, tune into this kind of news channel. So what has happened is that Google and Facebook sort of at the end of, of last year said, um, okay, well, we're going to take some responsibility and, and make some changes, especially in light of the US election and the amount of fake news um, that, that is sort of broadcast or supported. So they said, okay, we're going to start recognizing what is a fake news site and we'll stop taking those advertising dollars. It's very nice of them to have done that after the US election and they made their money, right? So I just always want to think about like who, whose interests are actually at heart. And if it's a corporation, then it's the shareholders and revenue generation. And it's not necessarily what is morally or ethically correct for the broadest number of people. And when we rely on these algorithms, we have these inherent biases that are maybe undetectable to us. We don't get to decide what gets filtered in or out of our social media feeds. And we start taking the information that is there as the source of what is true and important and, and noteworthy. And maybe that's a threat and, and maybe it's not. So I'll, I'll lighten the mood with a cucumber. Does it play? can't really escape the internet and cats, right? Um, so I like that cat and the cucumber clip because um, it's sort of like it's hard to immediately pay attention after you've seen the cat and the cucumber. And our brain gets a little bit distracted. And that's what's happening in social media algorithms, right? It's one of the biases that are built in. Like, yes, we want to tell people about you know, the Manchester bombing or these terrible things in the news that it starts to feel like it's all dire straits. So you know what, we don't want to show people just all this negative information, so we'll throw in a couple cat pictures, cute animals, um, things from their friends, right? They artificially lighten the mood in that case because again, they want you to have an enjoyable experience in that platform. But if you start looking at your newsfeed and trying to dissect what's happening, you'll probably see the second thing that you see in your newsfeed is often an ad. If you click on the little carrot that shows you, you know, why am I seeing this, you can start to see the demographic and psychographic information that Facebook knows about you to think about why am I seeing this ad. So we're talking about that algorithm and how it decides what to show you and whether you'll convert. That's kind of one way to investigate, like, what, is the, what does the machine think it knows about me? And there are lots of ways that marketers and designers and software engineers and engineers of products kind of leverage these different aspects of our brain. You get a lot of neuromarketing um, starting to happen. And so design kind of triggers 
certain actions. These are positive examples, right? Pokemon Go, designed to get people up off the couch, a video game designed for, for movement. And sometimes the bias is not necessarily by design, or we minimize the risk, like maybe there's just a small 1% bias, right? Like, what impact could that really have? And so this is a study that was done by Columbia University, and it used a computer simulation program, so predictive kind of analytics, that looked at gender bias in the workplace. And so they said, okay, well, what, what is the effect of a 1% bias towards hiring men versus hiring women? So they had this fictional company that started off with um, you know, an organization of 50% men and women at every uh, pay grade. And then they used these predictive analytics around hiring and employee churn that applied this 1% bias towards hiring men. And what they found was that after all the original employees had turned over, the organization had only 35% senior management who'd be female. So you can see how that continues and it's sort of um, without real, a real conscious look at that, sort of eliminates a, a whole gender from certain roles within an organization. And you think about how that happens with hiring and recruitment of people who prefer maybe Irish sounding names or prefer younger people versus older people, or people who went to the same school that they went to, or they make a quick judgment based on your appearance in an interview. Right? There's all these small biases that get worked into, um, into that practice. And this is a fantastic TED talk um, that we're not going to watch, but it, he talks about algorithmic trading in the stock market and all of these uh, algorithms that sort of run our life, not just stocks, but Netflix predictions and what happens in our newsfeed. And I, I recommend watching it because it's an interesting look at like, oh yeah, that's awkward, right? There's lots of, of algorithms that are making decisions for us that we're not necessarily thinking about or being aware of. Um, so I think we'll, t we'll take a break and then when we come back, I've got some virtual headsets that we'll play with and I'll pass those around and we'll talk about AR and VR and some of the fun stuff. So, um, AR versus VR, augmented reality versus virtual reality. The, the difference really is that augmented is like 25% virtual reality and virtual reality is 75% virtual reality. So with uh, augmented reality, it's basically just a piece of technology that is creating this computer generated enhancement or overlay on your, on your reality. So people are probably familiar with Snapchat or, or Pokemon Go. Snapchat, the filters that you use that apply a mask to your face, this is augmented reality. Uh, you'll see it in things like the IKEA catalog has this enhancement that lets you look at what the piece of furniture is going to be like in your own house. Uh, L'Oreal Makeup Genius has a really interesting app that you can apply different makeup features and then make in-app purchases for the physical product. And then virtual reality is different in that you are um, creating this virtual experience. So it's much more immersive. You have the headset, there's usually audio visual that you put into, um, into your ears as well. And the idea is that you feel like you are virtually in that world. And often when you play these games or you watch VR movies, you start to forget about the surroundings around you. I was telling Julie the very first time I was using this uh, PlayStation VR, I was like, I don't really play shooter games, so let's play one of those. And I was like blasting all these people. And I didn't realize that the earphone jack had come out. So the audio is like blasting through my house as he was trying to put our son to bed. He <laughs> came downstairs just like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I'm killing people. It was crazy. Like, it, you're in this kind of, I was in this getaway van, and with your hand, you can, like, grab your soda. So, like, it's this, it's, a, it's weird. It's a weird kind of experience um, to be in. It's definitely what they're talking about with immersive. And for VR to work, what you actually need is a PC or a game console or some type of headset, like what we have here, that can play 360 apps or uh, games or movies. So the headset has to kind of secure right in front of your eyes. So the way that our eyes work is that we focus in on a certain point. Um, 
Our ears are different, they're bioral, so what happens is a sound over here, we hear more quickly in this ear than this one, and our brain understands, oh yeah, where that sound is coming from. Our eyes focus on a, on a point and come into focus. What's happening with uh, a VR film is it's actually, um, you know in old school movies where you see binoculars and they're like two round uh, images? So what's happening with those VR movies is it's actually two identical little movies that are playing side by side, kind of like a pair of glasses. So your eyes are not focusing on a single point. They're focusing straight ahead on these independent images that are playing for you. And that's what's creating the sort of 3D sense or space. So in order to actually um, you know, have that experience, the headset has head tracking, which understands where to move the, the image. And to actually create VR, you need a 360 degree camera. So that's what is in the top image, the little bubble, like the, it's a camera, it's got multiple lenses. So when they're filming, it is filming in 360. Um, when you're looking at uh, Google Maps or you want to see images from a location and they have the 360 view, you can take those with your phone. And what that software is doing is it gives you a dot. You move the image to the dot, it gives you where the next dot it needs, and then it starts stitching together those images to make the 360 view that you, that you see if you're, if you're um, doing image search on Google. So the other thing with these um, cameras, because you can kind of take a bunch of GoPros and, and weave them together and create a 360 camera, um, you need to be able to film in a really high, uh, at a really high film rate. So if you think about those old school newsreels where the people are walking in a really staccato kind of fashion, it's because that was filmed in 16 to 24 frames per second, and our eyes see the lag. Um, with, with VR, you have to film in at least 120 frames per second, because what happens is the image is so close, your brain picks up on the lag if the film speed is not fast enough. And that's why sometimes you'll feel a little bit nauseous if you play these games. I kind of think it's because your eyes are not focusing on a single point the way they're meant to. Um, but there is that kind of um, you know, seasick uh, feeling that can happen. And it is usually related to the, the bit of lag that is either perceptible to you or not. AR is a lot easier to create. There are a ton of programs that you can use, even if you are a non-programmer, to create little um, augmented reality apps or, or games or sort of features. And of course, the easiest thing is just to use an app everybody's already using. So if we think about Snapchat, um, I, I tried to be super cool and make a, a filter for our class. Um, because this is easy to do with Snapchat. You can do that for any kind of special event, birthday, wedding, whatever it is. Um, and so it's a limited time filter that you can apply. And all you do is you upload a PNG file that is uh, certain dimensions. And it has to have a transparent background. And then it get, goes through an editorial process. And you kind of create a geo fence around where people can use your, your kind of special filter. So I tried and I was rejected. And the first time I thought, oh, it's because maybe I've got some UCD branding. And so they're rejecting it because I'm not an official UCD employee or I don't know why, but maybe they, they have guidelines about that. So then I tried something more generic, but then I think maybe it was my geofence is still around the university. It takes like 24 hours for it to get reviewed, so I've done three, they've rejected all of them. Maybe my art quality was crap, I don't know. Um, but it is, it is easy to do it. Um, just by following those, those instructions. But you need to think in advance, because it's one to two business days. And my little experiment, I think, don't geofence right around UCD. Yeah, Sorry? No. Yeah, you can set them up for free. They're only for a limited time. Um, and then what they do with like <laughs> real artists as opposed to me hacking away um, are all those ones where like if you want the pool bag lighthouse or like there's filters that are within Snapchat that go through a different process. But yeah, you as an individual can, can just make one. Sorry? Yeah, so like if a brand wants to do it for a movie promotion, then they're, they're paying for that, yeah. So um, 
Mark Zuckerberg says that VR is going to be the next platform. Um, he's invested heavily in it, so it would be <laughs> convenient for him to say that um, and, and build that demand. But there are certainly ex there's certainly existing demand for things um, like video games. There's lots of traction there. And then also in education. If you think about flight simulators using VR, or um, it's in use in, um, in lots of hospitals. So the Los Angeles Children's Hospital uses VR training for emergency situations. Um, they spend about four, 400,000 a year on training <laughs> staff. And they're replacing that with these VR kind of simulated environments where you can get you know, you get five people together using VR, not even necessarily in the same room, but they're having an, an experience in like an emergency scenario. So the way we do this currently, we've got the, you know, the emergency doll and you practice in this kind of simulated environment. But like mentally and emotionally, there's no actual emergency happening. Right? Whereas with VR, you can create that heightened sense of anxiety and the sounds and the noise and, and train in that kind of environment. Um, and again, not necessarily all in the same room. So another thing that is happening with VR, neuroscientists and psychologists are using AR and VR to think about um, how to measure what's happening in people's brains when they are in stress situations or they are drug addicts or they have phobias. So yeah, you're afraid of spiders, let's put you in the virtual environment with spiders and like generally you know, habituate you to this kind of, of stimulus. Or if you're addicted to certain drugs, what they're doing is they'll use a VR headset and they'll show you these things and they'll map to an MRI the activity in your brain to help people understand how to curb or suppress that craving. Right? So we're starting to be able to understand what is our, our brain, um, what kind of triggers or cues does it need. So uh, if you think of, about it in, um, uh, as a metaphor, you know, if you're having a fight with someone or like an argument in public, you start to notice that that's happening and, and check yourself and correct your behavior. This is what um, neuroscientists working with drug addicts is finding is that if they can re re record what's happening um, through like MRI machines and play back to your brain through these audio cues, it's poor behavior, and then show good behavior, your brain starts to self-correct. It's like watching itself perform badly and it's like, oh yes, I see what's happening there. So there are all sorts of really interesting um, kind of ways that, that medicine and science are taking these tools. And the consumer market might be slow to adopt. Something like these headsets going around are about 150 euros, so they're pretty cheap. But of course, you need the Samsung phone to go into it. Um, the PlayStation VR is about 400 euro. And, um, and then you know the cost kind of can go up or down from there, depending on the quality. I have a little Google Cardboard one. It's a piece of cardboard that you DIY fold into the same kind of headset and slot any type of phone in. Um, so it's basically the two lenses, some cardboard and elastic. Um, so that's a pretty cheap <laughs> option for, for a VR headset. Um, but I think the, the traction here is probably going to be in more sort of trade or industrial applications. Daqui is a smart helmet that's created here in Ireland, and it's used by like firefighters, construction, industrial engineers, and basically it's got this um, kind of AR application where if you're going into a job site or a fire, there's sensors that can detect if there's poisonous gas that could kill you. That's sort of helpful. Um, or if you're working in the scenario here and you're trying to understand, you know, blockages or to be able to see troubleshooting manual information, that's the kind of information you're seeing in an overlay in that helmet. Um, of course, the really cool stuff is what we can do with facial recognition software. Um, so I'll share these links with you. This is a little five-minute one from Vox about how all that, um, all those masks actually work. And it's similar to what I was saying, where we've just trained computers to be like, this is a chair, that's a chair, that's a chair. All of those selfies and photos that we load online allow computers to say, oh yeah, that's a face, that's a face, that's a face, that's a face. And so now it has like millions, trillions of, of images of faces that it recognizes. And it, like computers are just 
zeros and ones in the background. Uh, so they're looking at pixel data. They understand, oh yeah, so we've got a dark pixel and a medium colored pixel and a lighter colored pixel and, and the same on the other side. Oh, well that's an eye, right? There's your iris, there's the, the, the pupil and then the white on either side. And so like, oh, well yeah, there's the other eye. And so this shaded bit must be nose and this must be face. And then it maps your face and the sort of grid of your face to the millions of other faces that it knows and recognizes as a way to attach the mask to your eyes so that when you are moving your head, it's like, yeah, I'm following the eye. So it was a cool piece of technology, came out of Estonia. I'll mention them again later. Um, and that same kind of recognition software that's detecting a face, we see in ocular character recognition, optical character recognition software. So um, when I was traveling in Portugal, I've got Google Translate, hold up my phone to assign a menu, whatever it is, and it's translating in the, cam like in the camera kind of app. So um, that, that technology has gotten really, really good in the last six months. Um, lots of changes that uh, Google Translate has made using natural language processing and text mining in order to recognize and understand and, and translate on the fly. And then, of course, we have things that you're probably familiar with, like QR codes, where it, you, know, you use the QR code and it automatically launches a particular website or does an action. At uh, Christmas time, Amazon launched uh, Package X-Ray. So when your Christmas orders arrive, you could just scan the QR code and it would show you the product pages of what was in the box. So you didn't have to open it. You just put the wrapping paper on. There's your Lego. Excellent. Um, so you know, different interesting kind of applications for that. And you can see that AR is starting to have or sort of find its place in marketing. Um, Microsoft HoloLens might be the breakthrough. So we've got AR, VR, and then HoloLens is kind of holograms. It's a bit in the middle. Um, I'll show you what that is because it's kind of easier to explain through their product video than me describing it. Microsoft HoloLens brings holograms into your real world. Using transparent lenses, spatial sound, and an understanding of your environment, holograms look and sound like they're actually part of the world around you. That is mixed reality. With Microsoft HoloLens, holograms are viewed through the holographic frame centered in the middle of your view. This preserves your peripheral vision so you can move freely and connect and collaborate with the people around you. Holograms in mixed reality don't block out what you can see and hear. This enables you to engage with digital content and tools alongside the objects in your real world. Holograms can be world-locked in a physical location, so you can walk around them, or they can travel with you. You can even hear them in 3D with spatial sound. Microsoft HoloLens is the world's first fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer. With the mixed reality experience of HoloLens, you can stay in the real world and interact with real people as you simultaneously explore 3D in 3D. So it's kind of fun. I mean, the idea is maybe you, you know, could go to like a World Cup rugby game and sit right behind the bench with your friends who may or may not also be in your living room, right? So they're kind of fun ideas, both practical in terms of business applications and then the consumer market. And so here is this device that, you know, is kind of like bulky sunglasses, the same way we used to have computers that filled whole rooms and now they fit in our pocket. I imagine that this type of technology is going to get smaller and less cumbersome to have on our face. And the same way as I was saying, you know, the pen becomes an extension of our hand, the phone is this extension of our brain, maybe we're going to walk around with these little um, headsets all the time and have uh, augmented or artificial or virtual reality just become an extension of our existing reality. And so maybe if that's the case and we start to be okay mixing realities, then maybe we start thinking about how do we extend our perception of reality. So as humans, we can perceive a 10 trillionth of a light wave. Honeybees can see ultraviolet light. We can't see that. Um, sometimes the snakes can see infrared. Um, so the idea is that, you know, 
we use currently machines to detect those kind of rays. We've got radio waves passing through us right now, microwaves, gamma rays. We don't sense that because we don't have the sensors to pick up on that. But maybe we just add on that kind of reality. Maybe we, maybe if you know your brain is kind of like Mr. Potato Head, then it's like, and now I've got X-ray vision, or I can see you know galaxies and and stars exploding, or I want to be able to see ultraviolet light. Um, what these neuroscientists are starting to understand about our brain and what computer scientists are starting to understand about computers is that in order to do this kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing is that they need to write computer programs that operate the way that our brain does. And our brain is just this big computer. It doesn't actually care what the, the data input device is. It's a processing machine. It wants to bring the data in and process it in order to make sense and meaning and then create some type of output. And it sounds really far-fetched, but, um, <laughs> but people are working on some really cool things. So this is neuroscientist David Eagleman, and he has a lab that's experimenting with sensory replacement and sensory addition. So what he's got on is this wearable technology. It's a vest. And it communicates with a mobile device that's capturing sound waves. And it maps those sound waves to vibration patterns in the back. And deaf people can, you know, if they put their hand on a speaker, they can start to understand the sonic world and music. And that's the technology that this vest is built on. Basically, the same way people who are blind can use Braille, they read with their finger, they get meaning, right? Your brain doesn't care if your finger's moving across the page or your eyes are the input device for that. They, they create meaning and understanding out of that. So what they're doing with this vest is they're just mapping sonic vibrations in the vest to speech that is coming um, from or recorded from a mobile device. And after a couple of days of training, people who are deaf are able to understand basic sentences. So the idea is that you could, you could train and, and wear this. And it's a lot less invasive than ocular implant surgery, which is how we can help some deaf people today. And it's a wearable device, and it's fairly cheap to make, which means we also have a product that can work in developing countries. So they're working on these interesting um, ways to think about you know, sensory replacement. You, you have lost some sense. Can we um, replace it with another piece of data input? And the twist to sensory addition is in the bottom graph. The, the blue yellow is kind of a little yes no game and what's happening is that that person is wearing the vest and they're getting some kind of input vibrations they don't know what it is and then they're prompted with a yes no question and what happens over a, a fairly short period of time is they start picking yes or no correctly more often the really crazy thing is that the data they're feeding into the vest is real-time buy-sell information on uh, the stock market. So the yes-no are real uh, buy-sell decisions that are being made. So the idea is like this person's connected into the stock market data and their brain is making sense of that. Um, the, the vest that Eagleman's wearing at the top is part of a TED talk that he did in Vancouver and at the during his talk, he had this kind of software that was running and feeding to his phone and to the vest that was tracking sentiment analysis and use of the conference hashtag. So he was literally connected into the emotions of the crowd. I mean, maybe one day I would do that and know if you need a break. Like, so it's kind of, it, they're experimenting with all these different things. And the idea is that, you know, Maybe one day you've got astronauts that are tapped into the health of the International Space Center or have these glasses on that allow them to see um, gamma rays and, and microwaves and things that you can't see with your natural eye. Or maybe we bring that down to Earth and it's less, um, less of, of, of science fiction or, or space. And we've got these emerging technologies and immersive technologies that are kind of changing the shape of medicine and neuroscience and computer programming. The same way that we have scientists who are mapping DNA, we've got neuroscientists who are mapping our brain in order to understand and detect patterns that will help us uh, solve things like Alzheimer's disease. 
And the same understanding of what's happening in our brain is being used to program intelligent computers like IBM Watson that can take really complex sets of data about patient health and history and be able to pick out diagnosis um, of, of disease that humans are less accurate at picking out or predicting. So when you have a computer that can think and use a predictive model and learn from reaction, it starts blurring the line between machine and computer. If the computer can think, then what does it mean to be human? Uh, the, these types of brain-to-computer interfaces already allow people with some types of paralysis to short-circuit their damaged spine. So at the beginning of the year, The Atlantic published an article about a man who's paralyzed, and he's using this brain prosthetic that uh, when, he want, when he thinks, I want to use my hand or to make a basic movement with my hand, uh, the brain-to-computer interface just bypasses the damaged part of his spine in order to allow him to form that, that action. So that's all sub, sub, sensory substitution. Um, and what is happening is, with number four is that, you know, if we get really good at these uses that are very practical and medically enable people to improve their life, why would we not just apply this to any general consumer who wants a, an interesting um, you know, piece of like neurological conditioning or, or feedback device. So in Australia, they have an attention-powered car that on the dash, it's sort of tracking your eye movements and um, different sort of biometric feedback. And if it senses that you're distracted or fatigued, it disables the car. <laughs> Great, <laughs> or not. Um, and you know, why stop there? We've got things like Fitbit that are monitoring our heart rate. We have devices that monitor our gait. Um, so what if you've got someone with heart disease or diabetes or <laughs> medical conditions like epilepsy where you need to alert someone, a medical professional or emergency services? So maybe that Fitbit tracks that sends that data continually to your GP. Or like, if you're immobile and down on the ground and it's not bedtime, then maybe it calls an ambulance for you. It, it sounds like it's really far away. And it might be, or it might not be. It, at the end of April, Elon Musk announced a new company called Neuralink. And it's exactly this brain-to-machine interface that, um, that we're talking about. And the idea is it's kind of like a wizard hat. So I will think things to you, and I won't need to communicate them. So maybe in this class, you'll all be wearing your wizard hat, and I'll wear my, my wizard hat, and then it'll just like through osmosis communicate the course material to you. I think I'm going to start practicing deep meditation, so that should I, in an airport security system, be asked to put on the wizard hat, I can eliminate all my thoughts really quickly so that someone can't read or understand. But the idea is that we're going to use all these pieces of, of technology for good. Um, and so he's got quite a long write-up on uh, Wait But Why that explains sort of what the new technology is. And if you don't recognize Elon Musk's name, this is the guy behind Tesla Motors and SpaceX Exploration, and Neuralink is his next uh, interesting project. So we're kind of headed down this path with machine learning and artificial intelligence and big data in the internet of things. And it's this order of magnitude that's larger than what we've already seen with the internet and the amount of data that we have just through our social media behavior. So it means in the near-ish future, sometime in your working lifetime, we're going to start thinking about, well, how do we reimagine transportation and self-driving cars? So my taxi has taken over Halo. They're buying up all these independent local um, players. Why? Well, it's, it's my taxi's owned by Daimler. What does the car company want with all the taxi data? They want the route and driving information for self-driving cars, right? So it's a, it's a data play, pretty cheap <laughs> data play. Toronto in Canada has become the hotbed for this kind of AI where Google has a research center there. Lots of the top car manufacturers are coming to Toronto to, and bringing these AI development teams there um, because there's sort of a certain level of expertise in, in creating these thinking computers. 
So we've got these computers that are going to think and drive for us, uh, that are going to self-diagnose patients, that are going to do x-ray materials, maybe we just um, you know, communicate through thought education material, and it means that there's these changes that will likely take place in healthcare, in financial services, in sales, and marketing, as the kind of like, you know, not just blue collar factory jobs disappear, but marketing becomes this automated predictive model. So the question is who is inputting the variables? What are the cognitive biases that we decide to build into our marketing programs? How are we going to know who to trust or if uh, a, an experience we're having is a trustworthy experience or what bias has been built into that? So that brings us to the, the blockchain, which is um, the last kind of piece of technology we'll talk about today. And the blockchain is basically this database. It's a database technology giant. Um, network that is a distributed ledger that's all encrypted. So uh, if you have access to a particular blockchain, you can put data in, you can take data out, but it's all encrypted, you can't change it. So the way this gets used is mostly for Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is a technology that's built off of blockchain as a way for sending money around and um, using it to buy things. And the same way that email leverages internet technology to send emails around, Bitcoin leverages blockchain technology in order to send money around. So it tends to get used mostly for financial services or the exchange of electronic documents or contracts. Um, NASDAQ is kind of leading the pack here. They have, um, they have a thing called Link, which is built on a private blockchain technology. And if you think about startups, really active, uh, aggressive startups before their IPO and before they tend to be generating revenue, will pay employees and investors in stock of the company. And so typically it's very difficult, long, expensive audit process before the IPO to identify who owns the stock, when it was sold, where it was sold, um, all of the ownership structure. And so this link blockchain creates a historical record of every time shares are bought and sold, who they're sold to, who owns what, so that when you actually get to that IPO, you don't have this long, expensive audit process. Everything is just within the blockchain and accessible. Estonia, uh, the folks who brought us, uh, Estonian programmers who brought us Snapchat filters. Estonia is doing really interesting things um, built off of NASDAQ's blockchain. So you have the Estonian e-residency card, which basically means that Estonians who are shareholders and firms on the Tallinn um, stock exchange can vote securely in their like shareholder meetings. They also have government issued ID cards that are built on this blockchain. So where we have you know, your um, PPS card or whatever your government ID card is, your driver's license, all of that is on this sort of electronic identity card that you have. And Estonians use that for voting in, um, in elections. Because I have come, I've placed my vote, it's a single transaction, the blockchain knows and recognizes, I personally have already voted, so I can't vote again. And they use these kind of e-cards for uh, healthcare records, for different facets of your life, like trying to open a bank account. Well, here's my identity. Everything about me that you need to know is, is accessible via this card which is a virtual card, not a physical card. And so there's lots of um, kind of skeptics around blockchain. There's lots of concerns about you know, security regulations and how we kind of manage in a digital world. Estonia is the only country so far that does electronic voting in elections. Um, but there's a lot of interest from you know, credit cards, financial institutions, and the World Economic Forum in November started this working group looking specifically at blockchain technology and how um, that's going to affect sort of uh, economics around the world. And the head of that is the former president of, um, of Estonia. So it's not just hype or some theoretical use of a piece of technology. There's lots of um, companies that are building applications based on, on blockchain technology. And if you think about or go back to the Internet of Things, all those sensors in devices, sensors in your car in particular, Toyota Financial Services is uh, toying around with the idea of using smart contracts that would be built off blockchain technology. So basically, you want to finance your car, you're going to lease it, you're going to make payments, um, you're going to enter your information or have accessible within the blockchain your financial 
information and your payment history and whether you've ever you know defaulted on a loan or been late to pay your rent and uh, Toyota in exchange for you sharing all of that information will give you a much deeper discount on the financing and what it means in the smart contract with the internet of things sensors in your car is that if you fail to pay make your monthly payment then the smart contract reverts the ownership back to Toyota and your car is disabled you can't get in you can't drive it it's it's been returned to them so the you know the smart contract idea is about um, designing for trust making it so that both parties know a little bit more about what they're getting into or what the purchase is we we're looking at Walter and Michael or two real estate agents the other day so if we're using blockchain for that kind of um, process the same way we do for Airbnb we want to look at what the host is like or the host wants to see what has this guest been like maybe we could see what it's actually like to work with these realtors not just trying to find people or testimonials on their website but we'd have access to sort of all of the their history and every client and be able to understand that and if we take that one step further the idea with blockchain is you know the home buyer experience is highly emotional there are a lot of players involved so you've got real estate agents you've got lawyers um, you've got your home assessment person that comes out and as the home buyer you're paying the largest sum of money for the thing that you know the least amount about so the idea with the blockchain is well what if you you know the same way in Estonia you've got an identity card for you as a human what if every single house or property had its own unique identifiable um, piece of data that you could tap into so I'm interested in buying this home I can see all of the information about previous owners any tips I can see uh, utility bills that are typically paid um, for that home so that I've got a better idea of how to estimate my budgets maybe so my bank can decide whether they're gonna help me mortgage that home so it, the blockchain technology is this idea of you know, creating smart contracts that validate the value of what you are buying and reassures for the seller that you are legit and are able to pay for that particular resource. So the idea is about creating transparency in all that data and helping people make sense of large data sets of information that might be around a thing or a person or a particular transaction. And that's where we're seeing that shift already in marketing from selling to helping. The idea is that you're extending that even further to thinking about how do we build trust relationships. So the cautionary um, word of advice for new grads that came out this week from Zuckerberg and, and Bill Gates is, um, is to be mindful of this revolution in robotics and immersion technology and to be thinking about you know what are the big projects that you're going to work on and what what will you think about or how will you find fulfillment if the jobs of the future are done by robots what does that mean for us as a society and so uh, Mark Zuckerberg had a Facebook yesterday at a Harvard University commencement address said that you know your parents graduated in a time where there was a certain amount of reliability that came from the identity you had with your job and within your community or your church or, or however you created uh, that sense of community and that today technology and automation is getting rid of a lot of these jobs not just blue collar jobs but knowledge economy jobs and uh, that there's also this kind of decline in membership within communities and that people are feeling more stressed and less disconnected and they're looking to fill these voids this is the guy who's created the largest and most active social networking platform is saying yeah people are are feeling less connected and so he goes on to say that if you're graduating in this world then you need to think about well, well how is it that you create or define the purpose of your life because it's not necessarily going to be in what you do as work in a traditional sense and so Bill Gates says very much the same thing um, that AI and automation are undergoing this seismic shift that is very similar to what happened with computers in the 80s so he'd be the guy that would know that for sure and uh, he's got a, a, a positive spin on robots taking over the world and that's that it gives graduates of you know knowledge, with knowledge um, that comes from these kind of university programs to think about well how do we how do we use human empathy which is a skill that is still much better um, <laughs> achieved by humans to think about well how do we how do we care for the elderly 
how do we think about reduced class sizes? How do we help kids with special needs? How do we do these types of, how do we turn our minds to these types of societal problems or challenges and to find fulfillment in being a better connected um, society with less of purpose and fulfillment? So that is, um, the, that, that's your challenge. I'm going to be long dead, but I might, I might uh, be in a home and need you to be thinking about ethics and confirmation bias and how technology is affecting our lives. So thank you very much. And I think um, this afternoon I would say continue to finish the audit if you haven't done that and work on the strategy components and if you are finished and handed in early that's great for me because I can give you the feedback uh, sooner rather than later and if you are away next week um, let me know what you're planning for the deadline submission so that I can make a calendar notation myself to check in on that I won't get I won't just pack my laptop and be <laughs> off to Canada um, so thank you I'll see you Tuesday we'll talk about marketing automation and ad technology and all the rest of it <laughs> have a nice long weekend are you are you gonna stick around in the afternoon and do work or are you off to separate things I'm just wanting to know should I come and check in in your office or Okay, well, if, if you get stuck or have questions of things, just, you know, send me an email and I'll, I'll help you move along if you're doing that.